Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Maggie Chopade. I work with the UVA Clubs and Global Engagement Team. So excited to welcome you to the entertainment, UVA Entertainment of Los Angeles' July speaking event with Sarah Unger. Uh, before we get started, just a couple quick items, one of which you heard me mention at the very beginning. Please do make sure that you are muted. Would love for you to share your video, for you to have an interaction, but it just helps cut out the background noise so that there are no distractions. Uh, please keep in mind, as I mentioned again, that we are recording this event, and we will have time for Q&A near the end of the event, so uh, feel free to join us during that time um, to ask Sarah any questions. You can use the raise hand feature um, in order to ask her personally. So with that, um, and without further ado, let me introduce Justin Paxton, who will be introducing our speaker. He's a 2010 theater and dance graduate. I'm sure many of you know him and love him as he's been involved for many years as the president of UVA ELA. And uh, Justin, would you like to begin with introducing our speaker? Thank you, Maggie. And thank you for not saying how long I've been involved with the club. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Justin. I am the president of the UVA Entertainment Club of Los Angeles. I see many familiar faces and a bunch of new faces today. So glad to see all of you all. And we're really glad to have Sarah joining us today. Sarah is the founding partner of Cultique, which is a cultural insights and strategy venture of Civic, which is a Seacrest Global Group company. Um, and I assume that you all know how to read, so I'm not going to read her bio out to you. But I will say that she and her team of analysts are devoted to working with brands such as YouTube, Apple, Warner Media, Disney, ABC, NBCU, to help them navigate fast changing times, recalibrate for new audiences and cultivate growth in an uncertain world. And we will definitely dive into what all of that means uh, in a little bit. So I have a few fun questions just to get us started off. Um, so the first question I have for you, Sarah, is what has kept you sane during the quarantine period? Hello, thank you for having me. Um, sanity was a must, uh, sometimes hard to come by during the quarantine period. I, I mentioned that I did get a pandemic puppy, which was one of those uh, key life changes for my, for my lifestyle. She's a very high energy German short haired pointer puppy. So keeps me active um, and really, I named her Shepherd because she's a guide to me. She's taught me so much about patience um, and, uh, and selflessness, although she brings me so much joy. I think the other thing I would say is that I really, I fuel up on outdoor adventures. So a very, very large silver lining of this pandemic has been um, exploring nature with greater flexibility. Um, I think we all worked really hard often from home during these uh, pandemic times. And so the uh, flexibility of remote work to be able to spend more time outside hiking and adventuring is really, really key to me. I think um, I really leaned into my inner wild. I did quite a bit of hiking, off-roading, a lot of national parks exploration. Um, and I was a former New York City gal for, <laughs> I, I'm from New York City. Uh, so taking an off-roading course, I think was the culmination in trying to scare the, uh, you know what, out of myself. <laughs> <laughs> new skills, new skills. So it definitely has kept me sane. I feel like I've in some ways been able to live my most authentic life um, during this period. And I'm looking forward to continuing that. That's awesome. Yeah, we, me and my partner, we've definitely reconnected with, with the outside again. We've been uh, camping a lot. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's been great. What it, uh, you say a bunch of national parks. Have you, do you have a favorite one that you've been to recently? Wow. Well, all domestic. Um, I think even, I would say Bryce Canyon is always like stunning, 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 but um, Yosemite, Yosemite probably capped it off for me. I think I stayed at a place right within the park. So it was very immersive. And we studying the ascendance of nature in general has been something yeah. we've had an eye on. Um, so I, I would say that's been fantastic. Even not national parks, there's a lot of um, state parks, national, you know, national monuments, things like that. So even if the national parks are crowded, there's so much stuff off the beaten path or even local hiking trails. I live in California and so as many of you do, and so it's, it's, it's easy to do so. Uh, I think it's one of the best, it's free therapy. 
as I said. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. It's true. Um, I remember like that. That's pretty much for a while. That's all you could do, right? Was get outside. So. Totally, totally. <laughs> and, and even if it's not a national park, the idea of just like going for a walk to clear your head. I've been so excited to see how many people love walking. Um, I yeah. feel like just taking a neighborhood walk is so simple. It's something I always tried to do. Um, especially previously, LA was such a car centric culture. As a native yeah. New Yorker, I was used to walking and really using that time to think and work out all my problems. So when I moved to LA, I had to become more conscious in that regard. Right. That totally makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So after you go hiking, what's your favorite <laughs> restaurant or takeout in Los Angeles? Yeah. Good question. There's so much here. Um, I am a sushi fanatic. I love sushi. One of my favorite pastimes in New York was taking advantage of all the different sushi restaurants on, you know, close by. In LA, I've searched them out a little more in a, in a more dedicated way because the city is so much more spread out. So yeah. I will shout out a place called Q Sushi in downtown LA. I went right after it reopened and was able to have in-person omakase, which is, you know, sushi, the way it's meant to be served, right? You just trust the chef and um, the setting is simple, but dramatic. Uh, it was right after getting vaccinated. So it was like very blissful to <laughs> dine in person, yeah. take out sushi though amazing, you know, there's, there's something occasionally lost in transfer. So sure. it also felt a bit nostalgic it reminded me of you know my new york city days and that <laughs> that's Cute. awesome thank you for that recommendation <laughs> um okay so you're you've hiked you've got your you've got your sushi now what are you binging in terms of a show movie book or podcast <laughs> amazing i moved i've fed <laughs> now i'm gonna flip that um well i i'm usually reading and watching a lot of different stuff at once and i'm gonna give you a dirty little secret of how i consume content when i'm watching I watch a lot on my phone. I know it's crazy. Cinematic big screen experiences I love, but I'm a volume watcher. I'm a cultural analyst. So I'm trying to watch as much stuff as I can. So I really uh, take advantage of having my phone and I always get the uh, iPhone with the biggest screen to make it almost like a mini iPad. Um, <laughs> so in terms of what I'm watching, I, so all that said, I'm going to, um, and I'm eagerly awaiting the next season of Succession. That's like my one of my absolute favorite shows. Very excited. Uh, I'm going to give you a book and some music because I was recently on a cross-country trip and I got to read a lot. I am reading a book on Hell's Angels by Hunter S. Thompson. <laughs> and so awesome. I my, my boyfriend has a bevy of motorcycles, so I've come to be a very frequent passenger. We obviously aren't Hell's Angels ourselves, but the readers have been fascinated. <laughs> it's a throwback to like 19 would you tell us if you were an angel I, I, you know i well yes yes actually the angels as you learn in this book are quite proud of it the image even even if they're a little more isolationist in some regard being able to wear that um hell's angels logo on the back is you know a big part of the culture but um it's really a throwback to 1960s outlaw culture and in some ways you know the angels were predecessor to sons of anarchy, which was one of yep. my favorite shows on FX. If you ever watched it, um, they have a current spinoff Mayans MC. It's just really good gonzo journalism in true Hunter, uh, you know, S Thompson style. He, he always puts himself in grave danger while remaining in good spirits. And, you know, is it wise? I don't know, but there's a lot <laughs> of that. So. But it's great yeah. to read, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. exactly. Mm. Um, awesome. one, one other music thing I'll sh share is the artist Machine Gun Kelly. He's just, I, I don't know if you know him, it's not the uh, former mob member Machine Gun Kelly, it's the current musician Machine Gun Kelly. A little also known while, as Megan Fox's boyfriend. Megan Fox, right? <laughs> yeah, very bad boyfriend. He, he released an album that was a uh, transfer from rap to more sort of punk rock, although mm -hmm. it's really genreless. Genre is like not relevant anymore as a categorizer for a lot of musicians who are just sort of multi hyphenate artists. And so yeah. he he's just so unabashedly himself. And I loved his pop punk throwback because it made me feel like a kid at Blink-182 concerts. Travis Barker was a big, you know, a force behind that album, who is now known as Kourtney Kardashian's boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Pop culture. So check out his album. I think there's a lot to love. Awesome. I love Travis Barker and Blink-182, so I'm going to have to check that out. <laughs> um, okay. 
So now we've gotten to know a little bit about you. So I'd love to just kind of go a little bit back to the beginning of, of the story. So particularly like with your time at UVA, right? Um, yeah. So maybe what was the decision that led you to go to UVA? Awesome. Well, UVA, I'll be totally honest with you. I was obsessed with how beautiful the grounds were. I'm a very vibey person. Vibe is very important to me. Mm -hmm. And aesthetics in culture are so key today, but I feel I feel almost validated by that. I wanted to be at a place that inspired me just from the external to the internal. And so I visited it. I remember I drove uh, with my mom. I still had my learner's permit. I think she let me drive on those, <laughs> <laughs> drive on that route. Uh, and I remember it was actually pouring rain. And I thought if I can love and be so inspired by a place in the rain, I'll definitely love it when the sun shines. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so I visited it and I, I just, I knew I would be happy in terms of being inspired. I wanted a place that really felt like college and a setting that felt like academically inspiring, which of course the architecture does being one of the most not notable kind of heritage pieces of the university also, I was really enamored with American history at the time. I had really good American history teachers in high school who served as mentors to me. I had seen the play 1776 on Broadway and it's information. <laughs> so like, think of me as an early Hamilton geek. Um, and, yeah. and I visited the university and just felt like this is where one studies higher knowledge. The other thing was, I think, my dad is from Birmingham, Alabama, even though I'm from New York, and I wanted to explore a different part of the country and see if I could get out of the Northeast a little bit and expand my boundaries. And now I'm on the West Coast. So obviously hopping around has been part of my kind of life journey. Yeah. Do, do you consider Virginia to be the South? That I did learn is the debated point. <laughs> For me in New York, it was the South. So I'm going to go with yes, but I understand like anything else in this world. Things <laughs> it's we a very heated about, topic. <laughs> yeah, it is a very heated topic. When we, when I, it was, we talked about when I got there and it was super, super humid in August, I was like, okay, well, in my mind, this is the South because I've never experienced this weather. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> like New York City on a hot summer day, the smells, the sights, as anyone knows that's also pretty uh intense so <laughs> it's very yeah. different <laughs> yeah exactly but there was though to to answer your question because I had thought about it a lot I don't think at that time now this was some time ago I'm sure it's different in, in some ways now in terms of what the cultural um hallmarks are it did feel like a culture shock to me at the time I always talked about my New York self. I had like black, white, and tan in my wardrobe. And I remember going to a football game, people were wearing sundresses and I go, what's a sundress? And, and someone let me one. <laughs> someone, <laughs> some kind girl let me uh, a sundress. So that was that was a, a new thing for me. Um, and certainly not everybody's college experience, but at the time was a signature part of you know UVA football culture. Yeah, even when I went in 2010, my friends from New York talked about ex like experiencing culture shock they were like you know right. it's just a very different place <laughs> totally um, totally what was your major or minor yeah so I double majored when I was there in history and psychology which to me made perfect sense but to a lot of people at the time were like what why that and that and in some ways I think it really prepped me for being a cultural analyst yeah. I you know my approach was I took the classes that I found fascinating and I figured out what majors would best allow me to do that I was trying to kind of learn about the unseen forces both both internal and external that make society tick. And it really is very prescient for my current role. I remember focusing in psychology on memory and mm -hmm. abnormal psych. Those were two areas that I really enjoyed learning about as well as psychology of gender. Um, and I was even considering being a therapist at that time. I really wanted to understand why the mind works in abnormal psych, what can cause our mind to deviate from what's considered scientific norms. 
Um, and, and ultimately, I think why I didn't become a therapist is I wanted to study society's involvement as well in terms of these forces that shape society, hence my history focus. So I yep. had that major um, to, to address that. I do remember focusing on American history in the 20th century, especially. Um, I ended up taking film and jazz classes as part of this. Um, and then in terms of a minor, my kind of like unofficial minor was I spent a lot of time at the comm school undergrad taking advertising classes. Um, there was a, an amazing professor who has since um, passed named Jack Lindgren, who taught a class called promotions and I learned so, so much about marketing and advertising from him. So uh, that was it. That was a big part of my UVA experience. That's awesome. You kind of just answered this next question, but maybe if there's another person yeah, another class. Yes, was there was course. there a class or a professor that was extremely influential on yeah. you? Oh my gosh, many actually. But I'll I'll tell you a little bit about why Jack's class, and then I have one that I think uh, what I I would probably put you know as the cherry on the uh, on the Sunday. So Jack's class certainly was influential. We would take a field trip to big ad agencies in New York City, mm -hmm. and I feel like that's such a gift to give students to get them in that working environment. Yep. The class at the time was actually co-taught by an executive at McCann Erickson. So it oh, felt wow. really practical and often in the fields like, you know, entertainment, even marketing, PR, no matter what it is, you're dealing with theory. So the more real world experience you can get, the better. So I was just so grateful to be able to get that um, just not only academic, but, you know, almost corporate experience from that mm -hmm. class as well. Um, one other class that stands out, you know, in a very, very important way was um, a class with Professor Julian Bond, who has also yeah. since passed away. Um, it was my first year in college. It was a very small lecture seminar. It was held on the lawn and it was really focused on the civil rights movement in the 1960s. He, of course, was in the trenches, a big part of it. Hearing his firsthand recollections was amazing. Um, and, you know, for those of you who don't know him, he was former head of the NAACP, an amazing person. That to me, just emulated what you could get out of a, a class yeah. um and I've thought about it a lot over the years yeah no I didn't I never had the privilege of taking a class but even just being on grounds at the same time as him and like seeing him around grounds it was like a very like global eye-opening moment for me right like that mm -hmm. um he's such a pivotal person to history and like there he was just like walking across the the street from me right I know I know, <laughs> I know the caliber of talent that we were exposed to is really amazing in that regard and I feel so lucky to have studied with people who as an adult I still read about I read about yeah. their opinions their academic pursuits I love seeing the university reference so thoroughly in you know other major media outlets um which of course is validating yeah institution yeah. Do you have any advice for any current students that, that might be watching now or, or the recording in the future? Sure. Yeah. Um, I used classes really as opportunities to educate myself. I think I mentioned in the areas that I was fascinated by, and I didn't worry so much how they connected. That's just always been how my mind works. Like the world is connected in many intricate ways and they don't always have to be obvious at the time. They'll become obvious later. And so I took classes in jazz, film, nutrition. In, in my mind, it was like the multi-hyphenate approach to college. Um, of course, pending there are certain requirements you have to meet. But I think also in the summers, I'd work in New York City. I'm from New York, so I had the you know, ability to go back and, and work, uh, work in the city. And I would try out different internships to get the corporate experience. So that blend really it really helped me expand my mind in a way that would be very helpful for my first job. I, I definitely do think that when you graduate, there's still a big gap between college and the real world, one that certainly universities are helping resource and address. But mm -hmm. the more you can self-educate on, you know, what it's like to um, what it's like to be in a real world working experience, as well as just the simple life things like managing money, <laughs> and yeah. rent, things like that, which you may address in college, but certainly feels different when you're on your own living um, in a postgraduate experience. So the, the more you can self-educate in those areas, the less intimidating it is when the jump happens. So yeah. I kind of would try to blend these very pursuits that were fascinating to me and then testing it out in the real world in the summers. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great advice. I wish 
someone had taught me how to an adult, how to adult before I had to be an adult, right? (laughs) I think there's more books on adulting now. So, you know, people have recognized that there's a gap that happens. And in some ways, that's just part of the process. But I think, um, I do think younger generations are becoming wise into the fact that there's a lot of, you know, real world life experience that, um, that comes into play as soon as you, as soon as you leave campus. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's a great transition. So you, you've graduated from UVA. Mm-hmm. Um, now let's hear a little bit about your career path and how it led to you working at Coltique. But if you don't mind, let's start with um, what exactly is the role of a cultural analyst, uh, cult, yeah. sorry, cultural strategist and what, um, what do the responsibilities kind of consist of? Sure, absolutely. And strategist analysts, they're almost, they're, they can be sort of the same. (laughs) I think we analyze culture to provide strategy on how to implement our analysis. We're not just analyzing to hear ourselves talk. So it's, I think think it's, 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 you know, steps in a process. So I'll give an analogy that we, we give often to help kind of um, add some tangibility to the discipline. It's a metaphor. So we often, we think of our clients as building rocket ships and our job is to then, if you're, they're building rocket ships that are going to launch, our job is to study the cultural atmosphere, helping them calibrate correctly in order to, um, in order to have a successful launch and meet their brand audience and business goals. So what we do is we are basically, we're very bespoke. Nothing we do is like a syndicated report that people get. We're paid to think and create cultural insights that are very mission critical for businesses, especially because the world's so chaotic right now, things are changing really fast. So we're really our clients' eyes and ears, where there are sort of paid cultural investigators who are figuring out what's happening in the world at large. And our discipline, it's very specialized. It sits at the intersection, I would say, of cultural anthropology, branding, I have some brand strategy in my background, and business strategy, which is how to kind of innovate your business to meet meet the future. And we work very cross sector. We have, of course, though, special expertise in media and entertainment. That's a big area of ours. Um, It's initially why I moved to LA. Uh, So what I just described, often we're doing this for people who are creating content. We'll literally work with people who are developing content, marketing content at any point in the process. And often increasingly we're doing it soup to nuts. We'll work with people from the inception of the content to getting it out in the marketplace. And what we're doing is helping them calibrate it to make sure they're not making stuff in a vacuum and they're making stuff that resonates with consumers. Sometimes it's also helping people make sure that they don't do anything that's out of touch, tone deaf, or uh, culturally out of step with current perceptions. Um, and and, and that's, that's pretty critical in, in our world today. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that metaphor is it very much helps and that's very helpful um okay so um even if that was just for my sake that was really helpful um okay so now that we know what that is um can you share a little bit more about like what your career path was and and sort of what led to you to being and creating cultique absolutely absolutely um so I was a, um, a strategist prior to Cultique. Um, so Cultique, just a little bit on how we're set up. Cultique is actually an agency, uh, although we really don't call ourselves an agency, it's really a think tank model. We have a lot of brains working together to address um, our clients' issues. Cultique is part of an ecosystem um, that's civic entertainment group. So prior to Cultique being started, we became our own dedicated um, dedicated uh, offshoot during the pandemic when our discipline was doing really, um, felt really mission critical for a lot of clients who were like, what is happening in culture? There's a lot of signal. How do you, or excuse me, a lot of noise. How do we find the signals? So um, prior to that, we were in-house at uh, Civic doing cultural insights and strategy within this agency. And prior to that, I was at Viacom. I was a strategist working across their portfolio of brands. So some of the brands at Viacom, now Viacom CBS, you might know are Nickelodeon, Paramount Pictures, Comedy Central, MTV, VH1, BET. So I worked across all of those brands. Basically, like I was, I, I was 
at corporate and I was a resource um, that could be loaned out within the company for particularly tricky um, or important or future facing strategic situations. So that was amazing. And I actually got to go back and forth to LA a lot to work on Paramount. Um, and so that gave me an eye to uh, eventually making the move out here and focusing um, in, a, in, a, in a more dedicated way on the cultural insights aspect. So that was fantastic, I think. Um, Prior to that, before that, I was a creative planner at Ketchum, which is a global Omnicom agency. Yep. Don't know if people on this call are familiar with the holding company system within the advertising world. It's uh, If you're not, that's totally okay. But Omnicom is a big holding company that has a lot of different marketing and advertising agencies within it. One of the, one of the biggest and, and amazing ones is called Ketchum. And I, while I was there, I specialized um, in, I actually was a creative. I then moved over to research to help um, start a strategic planning department there, which specializes in insights. So in many ways, a predecessor to my role now. Um, but I yeah. also specialized in millennials and youth while I was there. So I am a uh, elder millennial, as they would say. And um, someone said geriatric millennial the other day, and I, I don't mean, like that term. I don't I'm like gonna, that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've always been a millennial who's kind of shirked the um, title of millennial, but but at the time we were, you know, the hot young thing, <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, so so it was it was honestly wonderful to help companies kind of understand um, my generation and as well as youth. So that was a decent focus, and as you can tell, I've kind of I've always enjoyed being at the intersection of things. I've always felt like why pick one field when yep. you can weave together learnings from all of them, and so. In some ways, I feel like my career has been a systems thinking approach where I'm just kind of um, exploring different areas and then weaving them together. That's wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing, awesome. I'll, one thing I'll offer is that, you know, when I was at Ketchum, for example, I was there for, for you know, nearly a decade and I, I took a very entrepreneurial approach. So now I'm an entrepreneur, right, with a company, but at the time I was very entrepreneurial. So I was really looking to figure out be opportunistic about what I was interested in, as well as what Ketchum needed for their business. And so that really helped me move within the org to not only flex things that I wanted to learn about and also, you know, experiment and meet new areas that their business had to address. Right, right. So would you say that's similar to the approach to leading like brand strategy during your time at Viacom? Yeah, I interestingly, it's a great question. I think I really think of my time at Viacom is um as cross training, right? Okay. Like hopping between departments, brands across a, a brand a big portfolio of companies. And I I think brand strategy, in my opinion, becomes more business oriented um, when you're on the client side, as we call it, than when you're yeah. at an agency. Um and I, I was essentially a spe special forces, you know, team. I was part of a team that got sent to whatever group needed our expertise. So I really loved how, how dynamic it was. I relished the ability to be super familiar with the business um, being, you know, in-house, uh, but also was kind of a bit of a third party perspective because I didn't work only at any one brand. Um, mm -hmm. So that, uh, that, I was able to leverage that. And, and it's also worth noting that during the time I was there, Viacom's brands were really interrogating what the value of a brand is in a world where content is becoming so ubiquitous. So, mm -hmm. so I, I enjoyed questioning what a brand means. In some ways, it becomes a tentpole, a marker for the audience to really help them sift through a sea of choices. And so it was in that scenario, I was able to really take all aspects of a brand into consideration. Like Nick Nickelodeon, for example, it's really as much a retail brand as it is a, a TV brand, right? Um, and an experience brand. They have the Kids' Choice Award, hotels. Um, and I think it was also really interesting to see how a portfolio can work together to foster IP. IP is a really big, important term in the entertainment industry, which I'm sure you know. And so, you know, for example, I loved working on SpongeBob SquarePants 
Sundance the musical, right? That was yeah. that was an interesting new manifestation of the IP. It was actually literally right across from my office in Times Square, so I could look out at it. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Right. I was supposed um, to see it, but coronavirus pushed the musical. <laughs> it was, I know, I know, I know. My my brother's on Broadway and I've been watching firsthand sort of the the torment and I hope it comes back and yeah. Course. But 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 from that time you'll see, you know, this kind of 360 approach to brand building. Now Netflix is starting to offer retail and merch for some of their shows. So really taking lessons from linear TVs. So I think it's it's been interesting to see the cross-pollination of ideas there. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, so we can open it up to questions. Uh, just one last question yeah. from me. Um, okay. You've described yourself kind of as like a cultural enthusiast. So maybe tell us about some of your favorite adventures that you've had. Oh my gosh. It's hard to pick, but I'll, I'll start with a few highlights. Um, <laughs> well, because I talked about Viacom so much right now, I'll mention when I was there, one of the first things I did, I remember I took the job and I said, but you need to know that I'm going to do the Everest Base Camp hike in like <laughs> a few months and I'm going to be gone in Nepal. And they were very gracious and let me do that. So I climbing to Everest Base Camp. It's not the top of Mount Everest, just to clarify, um, but it's the highest you can go in Nepal without really needing an oxygen tank on your back. And so I had just joined Viacom and I really had to understand um, how to fit this training in. So I would walk the stairs of the if any of you watched Total Total Request Live back in the day, it's the big tower in Times Square. I would walk those stairs, 52 floors, bottom and top, to train <laughs> for the hike. <laughs> it was great when I got there. It was fantastic. So <laughs> my, adventure travel has been a one of those things in my life, which has provided so much perspective, validation. It's really made me feel like um, on a day-to-day -day basis, the things that we deal with, it puts them in perspective, problems feel um, solvable and um, not you know, out of proportion when you're, you know, doing things that feel extreme and potentially endurance related. Um, another one of those examples that really impacted me was um, going to Mongolia and I did a horseback ride across Mongolia. I'm, I'm a bit of a neophile. So often I'll try to try my hand at new sports, perhaps a naive amateur, I would say. <laughs> um, a lot of the people on this horseback ride were more experienced, but um, my mom is from a farm. I grew up around horses. I had some family members who gave me kind of intensive lessons prior, and that was incredible to see this country um, where uh, people are so gracious and kind, and it's also so unpopulated compared to, right. um, you know, much of the Western world. I think the last one I would say is uh, right before the pandemic, uh, I could have gotten stuck in Russia, but I was in Siberia ice camping. Um, I went to uh, uh, Lake Bacall, which is one of the most uh, amazing lakes in this world. It's very deep freshwater lake. It freezes and the glass, you know, the ice forms this thick sheet of glass. And so you can do cool things like hike across it. So I did that. I wanted to see how my uh, West Coast self now performed in uh, sub-zero temperatures. <laughs> and, and, and what were the results? <laughs> you know, I remember they dropped us off on the lake the first day in within like five seconds, I turned to my travel mate and I go, I can't feel my fingers, but then you start <laughs> moving and it gets better. I think I went to REI and like bought out, if you know, those shakable hand warmers that you yeah. pockets on cold day. I think I bought them out of all of them. So if anyone <laughs> wanted to ski two years ago in LA, sorry, you were cold because I bought all the hand warmers. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I think adventures, uh, even during the pandemic, the adventures haven't been as foreign, but still as fulfilling. I think, um, I just think trying yourself in new scenarios where you may be outside of your comfort zone or skill set is a real confidence booster. And for me, it's been very fulfilling. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. um, all right, well, I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, if anyone has a question, they can use the raise hand feature or you can just unmute yourself and, and jump on in. Um, I had one question for you just to get us started, sure. uh, which was submitted in um, previously. So in your perspective, uh, in your perspective, what makes a great leader? Mm, good question. Um, 
I, as our, our job is to track patterns in culture. And so we're sort of increasingly looked, looking to anticipate cultural mindset by piecing together cultural tea leaves that we read in, in uh, whether it's conversations, body language, art, music, content. Um, and I think what we've been seeing a lot is we've encouraged clients and staff, especially leaders to focus on adaptability and be very open to fluid approaches, right? Things are changing really, really fast. And I think being fluid will be mission critical in the future as well. It really is today. And uh, our team's ethos is be water, which is uh, adapted from a Bruce Lee quote, if anyone knows the amazing Bruce Lee. Um, and I think that's really important uh, because having this, there's, I think psychologists describe it as a, a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. Mm -hmm. And having a growth mindset can make change Change can be stressful and scary for any leader, especially in a pandemic. I think leaders really had to deal with situations that were truly unprecedented, and that is yeah. enough to give anyone um, pause. But I think looking at it with a, a sort of optimist, not even optimistic, but just an open mind, mm. uh, to figure out what what can come out of this. What's this? What's the what's to be learned? What opportunities does this provide for us that it hasn't before um, is really important, especially in guiding, guiding people going through similar scenarios. Yeah. And I, I think that also dovetails into a continual learning mindset is really key for leaders. No one person can know all the answers. So the best you can do really is to ask, keep asking questions. And I, you know, I may be biased. I'm a cultural researcher. So of course, asking questions is something that I think is really important. But I, I do think one of my defining features has been curiosity. Mm -hmm. And so uh, being the student, I think that is something leaders need to really keep in mind. Yeah. It also really instills humility, which is a notable and very ascendant trait of modern leaders. Um, so I would, I would lean into those, those areas. Yeah, that's, that's great advice for anyone who's looking to be a good it's not um, easy, but I think there's appreciation for vulnerability in this world. Everyone knows the journey of life is is uh, is a interesting, joyful, and very trying one. <laughs> That's right. Kate, do you want to ask your question, or did you have a comment? Sure, I'm happy to ask it personally. Hi, Sarah. Yeah. Thank you for doing this. This is oh no problem. <laughs> I want I wanted to know if you had. Uh, foreseeing any cultural phenomena um, that made you feel a personal sense of dread, knowing that it was about to blow up or it was already underway. Yeah, I wouldn't say I felt dread in regards to cultural phenomena. I think because the forces of culture change so fast, I, I try to remain actually as much as I can kind of um, almost like unbiased, like I'm just analyzing it, right? I'm just watching the flow go up and down because if you become too sort of embedded in things, I think this profession could be pretty stressful. So, um, but you know, I think, I think we do track a lot of things to, to answer your question that are alarming in culture, right? I can think of a, a lot of things that kind of give me uh, dread per se, climate change and concerns around that. We've been monitoring this for a while and um, whether it's wildfires, extreme heat temperatures, these are things we've been looking at and talking about for years. But on the flip side, we also talk about the really hopeful progress in things. So, um, you know, I just gave that climate change example, regenerative agriculture, regenerative um, philosophies are something that we're seeing really, really grow. And that's giving me a lot of hope and optimism. So, with any cultural force that tends to be moving in a direction which I may personally perceive as negative, there's usually, in, there is always a cultural force in the opposite direction. It just depends what's ascendant and more um, popular at the time. 
I will also share that we use a little um, construct to help us track culture. Culture, we look at culture on a curve. So in any cultural topic, there's conversations that are residual. And so those are ones that are um, maybe more traditional in culture, have been around for a while, fading to the background. There's ones that are dominant. So that's the peak of the cultural curve. That's something that's like zeitgeisty, something you would talk about at a dinner party with your friends. <laughs> and then there's things that are culturally emergent. And those are the things that are maybe new on the fringes, but may become more popularized in the future. So if I see something that's maybe personally filling me with not the best feelings, I can look at a different spot on the cultural curve to find conversations to counteract it. <laughs> um, I mean, other areas, I think, you know, the amount of time we spend online and the mental health crisis is something we study a lot. And that certainly fills me with um, concern, but I'm also really optimistic about how much we talk about mental health now yeah. and the things that'll come out of it. So we distinguish between um, fads, cultural fads, which may be, I'm not sure if that's what you had in mind, and overall paradigm shifts. Our business is more studying big paradigm shifts and the why behind what happens. Um, we note fads, trends, things that are more sort of um, temporal, but, uh, but we tend to focus on things that are, uh, have longevity because usually we're using our insights to impact um, business outcomes that may be you know, down the line or in a planning cycle. Content takes a while to develop in the most most scenarios. The cycle is increasingly diminishing, though, with um, technology and just um, you know restructuring of process, which I think is a good thing. <laughs> when do you get brought into that process? Is it in the development phase or is it in the production phase? So you know, when do they pick up the phone and say, "Hey, Sarah, we need your your eyes and ears on this"? Yeah. It's at any point in the process, um, really. I think it it can be marketing. So that could be a show that's already fully baked and they really just need to understand how to kind of engineer the message and the themes in the show to best resonate with the audiences they're trying to connect to. Mm -hmm. Often, and probably most often lately, it's development. And so that's right. where you have, I mean, I would say with entertainment companies, our most common asset that we're looking at is scripts, not fully yep. baked content. And so um, we're looking at scripts, even sometimes we'll get in there when there's like not a script, it's just like a show summary. We'll listen to a re recording with the producers mm -hmm. and we're just taking the themes and providing cultural analysis. So we're used to working with whatever's available and because our business is so bespoke, we're able to kind of jump in whenever. That said, the earlier we can get in the better um, and most people who are impacting work in a kind of strategic way will always say that because then we can really influence it from the get-go. Um, and I would be remiss to say when people pick up the phone and call, they also may call um, my business partner, Linda Ong, who, um, <laughs> who, whose cultique, our company had been a brainchild of hers for a really long time. And she's really well-respected and um, known within the entertainment industry. So she certainly um, has been a big force in this. And we have a, a team of amazing analysts, um, one of whom is on the call today, Megan, um, who really are key, as well as a group of extended freelancers who are part of our coalition, who are regularly um, part of our projects and have expertise in all different areas. So we, we don't pretend to have all the answers ourselves, but we tap the right group of people to make sure all yeah. perspectives are represented. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, Amy, we've got a message. Would you like to ask your question? Um, I typed it out. <laughs> I can okay, say I can. I can. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming today. I can read what I wrote or you can read Perfect. the question. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you so much for coming today and talking about your very interesting mm -hmm. career path. Um, yeah. I didn't know really that this existed and it seems like you come from this intellectual background where you studied a lot of different things and had a lot of curiosity about different things and you're kind of like a cultural anthropologist mixed with a business and which is really <laughs> fascinating. And I guess what you know you said that your systems thinking weaving together, um, and I was wondering, uh, is there a favorite area in your career that you see yourself focusing on more in the future? You know, like as you've you know, been doing it for a number of years, you know, is there an area that you see yourself moving, focusing on more 
are honing in on, or do you see yourself just continuing on the same path? That's a really good question. And I would love to know the answer to that. <laughs> but I'm gonna, I'll give you- I would too. <laughs> right, I, you know, I think, I'll, t I'll tell you a few things. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. And it's just so lovely to get to share something I love with um, like-minded people. But um, I will say when I, I met Linda and realized that she had built a practice around this discipline, she she's been doing this for quite some time. I, I did the same thing. I said, what? There's, you can take the part of the job that I love the most and do just that. <laughs> and I, so, so that was a really sort of key thing. And I think when I look at this discipline, it truly is something that I love. I feel like it's what my brain was put on this planet to do that I could see doing this in some way, shape or form for, you know, for the long run, because, um, the people who are part of our team, we're chatting about culture nonstop regardless. It's great to be able to get paid for it. Like I right. would really express myself in this way, regardless of the role. That said, of course, I think it's important to keep iterating and experimenting because you want to stay stimulated and motivated and excited. I think a big part of my journey has been figuring out how do I do the work that I love in a way that also helps me fulfill the life I love. So remote work is really key for me in that capacity, because then I feel like I have the liberty to um, find that balance and get that cultural inspiration from exploring things that was harder for me to do in a static office scenario, or when I was just rushing around to through LA traffic to meetings. So that's been really helpful as well. I think one other shift has been, we, um, as Justin had mentioned before, we've been moving up earlier in the development cycle and entertainment. I, I started out in marketing and advertising, but as I, as I sort of grew up in that industry, I realized I wanted to be closer to the product, not sort of how the product is packaged and eventually sold. So from a personal perspective, I'm moving in that direction. Um, I'm even interested in, you know, content development, you could say product development. I think I'm, I'm always looking to get to the parts of the org where the idea is, you know, first crystallized and start there to have maximum mm -hmm. impact. So I would say definitely moving in that direction. And I also think we've started to work on, you know, travel clients, areas, wellness clients, areas where, uh, you know, people, I I love working on areas where I have personal passions as well. Entertainment's always been a huge love of mine. And that's why I pursued the industry. Um, TV, like growing up was my love language, but I, uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm also interested to touch other areas that I find um, personally, personally motivating. Oh, that's awesome. Any other questions from anyone? I'll also mention one other thing that occurred to me on Amy's yeah. question, just thinking, marinating further. Um, we, Cultique is one, one thing that we're aligned on is we enjoy experimenting. So yeah. you know, we, when we analyze culture, who knows what the output of that is? In some ways, yes, it's our cultural analysis work, but we've done collaborations with companies from a retail perspective. We've done, we like to work with artists um, to help them. We've had artists do interpretations of the Cultique logo. The art world is something I love. So I think we really think of Cultique long-term as a cultural vehicle that can have a lot of different manifestations, not just um, the rote day-to-day -day part of our work, although that certainly is the backbone and the joy for us. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I have one one more question from uh, the the pre submitted questions, and we can close out with that. First off, I just want to say thank you for your time. Uh, so, how would you say your experience at UVA informed how you navigate your career today? Mm. Oh, wow. I think. I think UVA opened my eyes to so many different aspects of um, sort of culture, thinking and society in ways that um, even though New York is an incredibly diverse place to grow up, even simply going to a different part of the country and meeting different types of people, that, that culture shock that I described was really crucial. It made me really feel like 
um, I could in a confident way kind of be thrown into the deep end <laughs> and um, learn and explore and find the different connections. So I, being on campus in that way was so pivotal. And as mentioned, um, I was so inspired while I was there just by the, by the setting, by the people I met. It made me very excited to learn. And mm -hmm. in some ways, my job has been, you know, lifelong learning. I'm doing the same thing that I did when I was there, I'm meeting people, trying to understand what they're about and translate and translate it into something meaningful. So I guess what I started there, I've just never really stopped doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a pretty good impact, would you say? <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think I appreciate educational institutions so much for this reason. I'm on the board of my high school alma mater, actually, and I have been for like over five years now. So I, I, I look at these centers of learning as um as truly important stepping stones in a person's intellectual and emotional journey. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree there. <laughs> well, Sarah, thank you so much for your time. This has been really incredible. I have learned an incredible amount from you. <laughs> and fine, you're fine. I'm excited to see where you and Colty go. Um, and uh, this recording will be posted on the UVA Club's Global Engagement YouTube page. Um, and we will send that out uh, to everyone who registered as well. So thank you all for coming. Thank you for your questions. And Sarah, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you so much. It was an honor. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. You too. Bye, everyone.